Good evening and welcome on behalf of UK Romania Group to the second of our Romanian Heritage Season events. These are brought to you in partnership with the Romanian Culture Institute London. In our first event last week, we looked at the broad challenge of built heritage conservation and preservation in Romania. And next week is reflection on Romania's vanishing Jewish heritage. But tonight, our theme is exploitation, a study of threats to Romania's wild places and efforts to preserve and promote this natural heritage. To guide that discussion, we're delighted to have Charlie Otley as a moderator. Many of you will know his fabulous documentary series, Wild Carpathia and Flavors of Romania. But to get Charlie here tonight, we had to interrupt work on his new documentary project. So if I can derail us for a moment, Charlie, I'm curious to know a little bit about um, I'm curious to know a little bit about this project, I think focusing on the Danube Delta. Maybe you can say a little bit about your production schedule, what you're trying to accomplish this film, and when we might get to see it. Well, um, thanks, David, and good evening, everybody. Uh, you're yes. <laughs> can you hear me? I can hear you now. <laughs> Great. Um, many thanks. Yes, we, um, we have been um, filming the Six in Our Wild series. We did five Wild Carpathias, and then I wanted to do a special on the Danube Delta because uh, I feel this is one of the main jewels in the crown of Romanian tourism and something that hasn't really been an area that hasn't been promoted uh, at all properly in the past. Um, it's, uh, you know, the largest wetland in the whole of Europe and uh, it deserves to be seen as the Amazon of Europe. And I believe a, uh, a place that people should visit from all over the world and a vital, uh, environment, uh, a vital biosphere reserve and, and essential to, to preserve from uh, uh, the threats that it faces. For example, overdevelopment, uh, pollution, litter, overfishing, unsustainable harvesting of resources. So we started filming uh, at Christmas time or shortly afterwards and the idea was to, to catch the changing seasons. So we, we caught the snow and the blizzards uh, in fact, got stuck and uh, we went uh, uh, down into the delta uh, and uh, through the ice and saw the lives of the fishermen there. And we want to catch the, the beginning of spring right into the summer and, and see how the landscape changes, the migratory birds arrive, cut with fabulous nature shots, interviews of the fishermen, the local cultures there like the lip of them and the Aroman cultures and uh, get a real insight into life there, but also address key conservation issues. Fabulous, fabulous. Well, I'm very much looking forward to seeing that. I think it's going to be what, the end of the year. We are very lucky to have Digi Network, um, uh, who have already um, agreed to broadcast it on National Romania Day on Digi24 and then Digi Life and Digi World. And then I hope it'll be on TVR and Canal D and Antenna and maybe even Pro TV after that. So fabulous. we shall see. Hopefully, everyone will have a chance to see it. <laughs> fabulous, fabulous. Well, on that, thanks. Thank you for that, Charlie. I'll, I'll hand over you to you now to, uh, to introduce the panelists and take us forward with our discussion tonight. Great, thank you very much. So I'd like to welcome three panelists to our discussion this evening. Um, so we start with Catalina Radlescu, who is a lawyer working with Agent Green, a non-governmental and non-profit organization for environmental and forest protection established in 2009. The aim of Agent Green is to investigate environmental crimes, to expose them strategically and to promote solutions for the conservation of biodiversity and ensuring the well-being of future generations. Uh, next up, we have um, Gabriel uh, Galnoski, who is the head of communications at Bear Again Rehabilitation Centre for Orphan Bears, Europe's only centre for the rehabilitation of orphan bears. Founded in 2014 in Romania's Hazmash Mountains, most bear cubs that reach its care have been separated from their mothers by logging activities. Its goal is to uh, mimic nature as accurately as possible and give its rescued orphans the best chance to develop and thrive when released back into the wild. Since beginning its work, Bear Again has saved over 150 bear cubs. Uh, finally, uh, I'd like to welcome Christoph Promberger, the co-founder and executive director of FCC, uh, together with his wife, Barbara Promberger. Uh, it aims to, uh, the charity aims to create a world-class wilderness reserve in the southern Romanian Carpathians, large enough to support significant numbers of apex predators and to allow evolutionary processes to happen uh, undisturbed by man. This new national park should be an icon for conservation uh, and emblematic for Europe. 
as part of the work of Foundation Conservation Carpathia, uh, is involved in creating a new sustainable green economy around the Fagarash Mountains for the benefit of biodiversity, biodiversity sorry, and local communities. So uh, I'd like to start with Agent Green first, if I may. Uh, Catalina, uh, welcome again. Um, could you tell us yeah. a little bit about the origins of Agent Green and how its work has evolved? Well, Agent Green started in 2009 and uh, I started work with Agent Green in 2011, but I, I knew Gabriel Pawun. Is uh, one of the founders of, uh, of the association from his previous work, even before he established uh, Agent Green. And um, I think they were um, something that um, actually uh, the Romanian civil society was missing because their kind of working uh, and uh, the thorough investigation on field and uh, in the forest was uh, never done before. And I, I don't know any other organization working uh, like that. So, um, so uh, basically the first question I'd like to um, throw in uh, then is, 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 uh, is this, is this um, you're working uh, as, um, as, a, as a very active uh, on the streets uh, organization. I mean, it's, it, it's, it, you have a huge social media following. Do you um, do you anticipate changing hearts and minds with the work that you're doing? What effect is it having, and and, and is the progress being made? Uh, on the conscience of, of uh, the people, yes, I think that it's a great impact because uh, Agent Green uh, made public many problems that were uh, were not uh, available <laughs> to say. Uh, for example, uh, in what I'm working um, on um, the forest management plans until 2018, so until we started to work on this subject, uh, all the forest management pl plans were uh, sort of secret, not officially secret, but anyway, they were not public. And we are still fighting to um, force the authorities to publish uh, these uh, forest management plans. We won in court several cases, but they still uh, refuse to execute the uh, decisions of the court. Um, a question to everybody. I, I understand it that, I mean, forestry law in this country is, is pretty good. Um, it's, it's not so much, it seems to me, the actual law itself. It's the, it's the policing uh, um, of it and the enforcement of forestry law. Of, if, can I answer that? Please, put it to the table. This is, uh, this is something that the, the authorities would like to, um, to, uh, to say, that the legislation is so good and we only have some implementation problems. Unfortunately, unfortunately this is not true. And uh, recently, the European Commission started several infringements uh, involving also transposition of uh, EU law. Uh, both on timber regulations and of the nature directives involving uh, uh, the way the forest management pl uh, pl plans are, uh, are passed. For example, um, for the forest management plans, the evaluations procedure, so the appropriate assessment, uh, the SEA assessment uh, were not done. And uh, in several locations, we found the forest management plans that were applied even without approval from the minister. I, so this was a legal uh, situation. This was established by, by law that they can do that. So the law is not so good when uh, it comes to uh, respecting the environmental legislation. Maybe from the point of view of, of, of forestry, it's, it's a good legislation, but it's not connected to the EU uh, environmental legislation. And it's okay. not Natura 2000 yeah. sites, for example. And, um, can I can I put that question to um, to Christoph and Gabriel as well? Do you have anything to add on that? Uh, yeah, I think <clears throat> I think you know we we are in the year two thousand twenty one. Uh, we are facing climate change, and I think what the Romanian law does not uh, recognize so far is that that times have changed. You know, we we are still looking at these forests as if they if they would be just uh, a source of timber. Uh, and not as something that we need in order to survive these, year, these times. You know, we are having water shortages, we're having rising temperatures, uh, we're needing the forests to sequestrate carbon that is uh, in the atmosphere. 
So, so this is something that the, the forest law doesn't foresee at all. So I think we need a major change in paradigm uh, how we look at forests in order to evaluate them in a way as they need to be evaluated. Um, so a consequence of deforestation uh, is the destruction of the animal habitat, which is something that Bear again deals with through its work with orphan bear cubs. How, how do you, um, Gabrielle, to you, how do you re rehabilitate a bear? <laughs> and uh, how do you know when and if it's safe to release them back into the wild? Uh, well, usually we get the cubs uh, that are found and proven orphan uh, from all over the country. And uh, it takes a long time. It takes about a year and a half for a bear to successfully be reintroduced into the wild. So the rehabilitation process goes in several stages. The first one being the stage when we get all the cubs from one year together and uh, we make them socialize in a smaller enclosure. So they start behaving like siblings after a while. And then uh, as they mature, uh, the, the space that we offer them, the natural habitat, which is surrounded by electrical fences for their protection, keeps growing. And at the end of the rehabilitation process, uh, we open the gate of the last enclosure and they step directly into the wild. But this happens uh, in a natural way when uh, they would uh, normally leave their mother's side in the wild as well. So if something changes in them and they feel a need to explore more. So you don't, you don't find you get sort of um, the bears going back into areas of human habitation, they remain wild, is that right? Uh, yes, we did studies on the orphan bear cubs released here. Several generations of orphan bear cubs were monitored using uh, GPS and radio telemetry systems. And uh, none of the bears that were released caused any trouble. And uh, this uh, was also compared to wild caught bears. And those sometimes went close to uh, communities and caused problems. And we think this happens because uh, bear cubs uh, take certain behaviors from the mother bears. So if the mother bear uh, roams around a town, for example, then the cubs catch on that and uh, they could potentially become problem bears as well. But at Bear Again, we have minimum contact with the cubs, which is the main principle of our activity. We feed them from afar and after the milking phase, we have no contact at all with them. Okay. What, what is the current legislation around the disturbance of bears uh, due to logging? I mean, for example, a forest, if a forester finds a bear den um, with cubs, are they required to cease activity in that area? Yes, they should, uh, they should check before making the, the works there and uh, stop until uh, the, the denning phase is over, which is usually April, May. Yeah, except they don't, as we've seen recently in that, that video were uh, shocking in the last few weeks. I don't know if you all saw it, but uh, um, yes. it's, uh, yeah, it, it's not necessarily happening. Um, deforestation is one threat to bears, but another is obviously illegal hunting. Um, these two issues go to a broader point of how a Romanian state protects the wilderness. Um, this is where uh, Conservation Carpathia is most active. FCC have a lot to do with this. So Christoph, could you summarize what you're trying to achieve in the Fagarash Mountains? And, and what the differences are between the FCC wilderness area and Romania's national parks. Okay, yes, thank you, Charlie. Um, I mean, I guess uh, we're sort of an organization that is now a little bit over 10 years old. Um, it started as an idea that, um, that was very, very ambitious, where everybody said, you know, we're a bit um, not really clear in our heads. Because what we have been doing, Barbara and I, um, we have seen these amazing Fagarash Mountains. It's an area of 200,000 hectares. So that's huge. You know, that's the biggest area probably in, in Central Europe that is still totally uninhabited. So within these 200,000 um, hectares, there is not a single village in there. Uh, there is rugged mountains. There is huge forests. Um, there is uh, virgin forests there. There is wolves. There is bears. There is lynx. There is red deer, chamois, wild deer. You just name it. So an area that we don't really find anymore in Europe. And so we thought, because we saw also the threats that were coming up with the restoration, uh, with the um, restitution of the forests to the former owners, which in principle, you know, I totally agree with that was the right democratic decision. 
But what happened was that a lot of these people, they got forests back where they had no relation to. They knew just that their ancestors had somewhere forests. And so what happened was that there was a, um, a big temptation uh, to you know, just, just cash in these forests in one way or the other. It's not everybody has been doing that, but, but enough people unfortunately have been doing it. And if you look today on Google Earth, you know, you see all the, all the clear cuts that, that followed uh, this restitution. And, but it's still, you know, there's still a lot of very, very beautiful intact forests. And so we thought, you know, in order to, um, to counteract these threats, there's also a huge opportunity at the moment. And that would be to declare the whole area into a national park. It could be the biggest forest national parks in Europe. It could be the most important uh, national park in Europe. It could be an iconic national park similar to what uh, Yellowstone is for North America or Serengeti for Africa. And it could be something that all the communities around could, could really benefit. Because the situation that we have right now is that these communities are very poor. Uh, the youngsters are all leaving. The education system is bad. The healthcare system is very bad. There is no jobs. There is no income opportunities. And for these people, it's a real difficult situation. So no wonder that most of the youngsters are leaving. So having such a national park, you know, that could attract a lot of uh, visitors. Um, and we know many examples where national parks have really been the, the, the engine of rural development in such an area. We could brand the national park and the Fagarash Mountains for all these small scale farmers to much better uh, sell the, their products because you know the products have a much better price if they come from such a natural area. And so it could be not only an instrument to protect the biodiversity that is there, it could not only be something for a Romanian pride, because you know, if Romania has the best and the most iconic national park in, in all of Europe on the whole continent, that would be uh, that would be a thing. But it could also, you know, have been very, very important economic instrument for rural development of all these uh, 28 villages that are around the Fagrash Mountains. And this is what we're doing. I mean, it's of course a very, very complex project. It's not something that you do in two or three years. Uh, but I think we're uh, well on the way, and uh, you know we're we're getting further ahead every year. Um, I want to ask you, what is the difference between the FCC wilderness, though, and the Romanian national park exactly? I mean, just to be clear on this issue. Well, you know, I mean, we want we want to uh, get the, the Fagrash Mountains to become a national park, but the existing national parks in many uh, in most cases are just an area that is partially it's protected. Uh, most of them don't fulfill the IUCN uh, requirements of having 75% of, uh, of the area fully protected. Um, so there is still uh, quite some logging going on in the national parks and the national park administrations have not been given the uh, tools in order to react to all the needs of these local communities. So the people in general, they're rather anti uh, protected areas and anti-national uh, parks because they see them just as something that stops them from doing things, from that stops them from developing, stops them from building, stops them from logging and so on. But the parks have not been uh, built in a way yet that they really bring a lot of um, positive uh, economic uh, advantages to the local communities. There are, it, it, uh, there are exceptions and I don't want to say it's everywhere like this, but most of the parks, unfortunately, are not what they could be. So, uh, to, to address this to everybody, really, um, you know, with the logging issue, is, is commercial logging in national parks and wilderness reserves a, a big factor when it comes to sort of national deforestation? And should we try to get it banned altogether? Um, can I can I um, can I ask for a response from Catalina on that one? Sorry, can you repeat the question? Uh, yes. Um, so, commercial logging in national parks. Um, how how much of a factor is this when it comes to sort of nationwide deforestation, and and should it be banned altogether? Yes, uh, commercial logging in national park it's uh, it's a problem. It's mainly because mo uh, several uh, parks are um, are. Um, um, I mean, 
Several parks uh, administration is uh, held by Rom Simpa that is also responsible for the logging. It is a, it's a national company that uh, main um, source of income is commercial logging. And they are also uh, the administrator of the protected area, of the environmental protected area. So they are clearly in a conflict of interest be before, uh, be, uh, between their uh, commercial interests and uh, the need to protect uh, the forest and the objective to protect the forest that should be the objective, objective of the administration of the, of the park. So uh, this is the main problem. And uh, for example, um, in one park, they, since 2014, from Silva failed to pass a, a, a management plan of the protected area because uh, the logging, the commercial logging would be stopped. Okay. No, Gabriel, do you have, yeah. Uh, Gabriel, do, do you have any, any thoughts on that? Um, yeah, well, um, as we know, commercial logging is also a good source of, uh, of income for many of the communities. For example, uh, here close to there again, there's a small community, which was a mining community and the mines closed and most of the income that comes in here is from logging activities. So that is something to be taken into consideration when, when making such decisions. So the local population, that's an alternative to the cut of such income. But of course, from an environmental point of view, that would be an ideal case. But of course, this is a resource and we need to figure out how to sustainably uh, take advantage of this. Do you, do you feel that given a lot of people in uh, rural areas don't really have money to pay, for example, uh, vast bills for electric heating systems and therefore rely on wood-fired central heating, for example, uh, and, yet, and yet whilst there are huge queues of lorries outside mills like Schreikoffer and Konishban and others, you, you, you find that in lots of areas, people find it actually quite difficult to get enough wood uh, at, at, a, at a reasonable price to sustain them through the winter for their hot water and heating systems. Uh, is, there a, is there a way to address that and how, how much of the deforestation that's happening is due to actually servicing these communities with firewood? Uh, to my knowledge, in order to receive an FSC certificate, uh, then this is one of the, the issues and one of the points that need to be checked. So the local population actually receives uh, uh, first uh, access to uh, their basic needs, cover their basic needs, which is firewood, for example. Yes. Yeah. Um, Catalina? Um, I some, somehow do not think that the firewood uh... The need of the firewood is one of the main causes of deforestation. No, I, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting it's a big cause, but I'm suggesting that, that uh, if, you, if you extrapolate it out to all the communities in the country that have wood-fired central heating, collectively, uh, it must represent at least a, a proportion of, of wood that's taken, especially when in order to cut the price of wood, people are delivering illegally in vans. Now, okay, okay if it's like one community in a couple of vans, but if it's right across the country and people are doing it all the time and i've witnessed this myself it must eat away at the forest in, in to some measure i'm sorry yes but there are forests uh, inside the uh, in, in fact inside the national parks and other forests so they can have woods firewoods from other forests and not from the forests that are protected and should be protected okay so it's, it's not not really a problem in your in your mind it is a problem because they are actually getting the wood from the national parks and they shouldn't. Exactly. Because we have enough forest outside the national park. They don't need to buy wood okay. from uh, environmental protected areas. Okay. Um, in, in terms of trying to take steps to reduce illegal logging, um, how about heavier taxes on the export of raw timber, for instance, and investment in furniture making grants and subsidies for redeveloping wood craftsmanship within the country? So we're not just exporting raw, raw product, but actually increasing the value of it here in Romania. Uh, Christoph, any thoughts? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, of course, uh, you know, the, um, it's with with everything, if you sell the raw product, uh, you get a little bit, and if you sell the processed products, you you make uh, you know much more money out of that. So uh, it's obviously uh, the right thing to process the wood which we have here. But I want to come back to the question before 
uh, just briefly, because you know, I mean, less than two percent of the Romanian surface is actually national parks. So that means that ninety-eight percent, over ninety-eight percent, are not national parks. And I think this is this is what is to me the most important thing. You know, we have in these ninety-eight percent still huge amounts of land which are of a very very high biodiversity value we've got lots of virgin forests which are totally unprotected we've got uh beautiful areas that are um you know full of birds of flowers of whatever that are totally unprotected and i think if you're not careful and and this is where i think you know we we have to be careful to focus too much just on the national parks because the national parks, even if you get all of the, the national parks, 75% uh, of them protected and then, you know, the buffer zone handled in a very, very sustainable way as it, as it should be. Uh, I think that's way too little. You know, we have to get way beyond that. I mean, on the one side, we have now um, the, the uh, decision of the European Parliament that 10% uh, of all the land of each country of each member state should be totally protected so um you know we we have to we ha we have to face that we have you know at the moment we have 0 0.7 percent of romania totally protected wow. so we have to we, we have to get a lot more so we have to you know just totally rethink the way we we uh we deal with the land here um I mean, yes, the local communities, uh, I mean, still about 50% of the of the Romanians live in rural areas, which is a very, very high, very high percentage and the big majority of them heat with uh, with firewood. But they've been doing that. So for, you know, the last uh, 100 years, so it's not uh, something that's totally changing. Uh, and, and um, so, you know, I mean, when we when we design a new system of forestry of or not forestry of using forests and the new system of protected areas and of course you know we have to take uh, these local communities into account and they're they're the key to everything but you know, we have to really think about do we want to sell our timber or do we want to sell the carbon do we want to sell the oxygen do we want to sell the the water that is being collected there and do we want to sell the the beauty of it and you know have people coming and, and enjoying that because by the end of the day i think that we uh, that romania can make much more money with these alternative uses of of timber plus it's a necessity you know we have climate change and we have to react to that and it's it's going to hit all the villages around uh it, it hits the the towns around it hits bucharest if there is a, a shortage of water and and you know we're still in a in a situation where we can really tackle that and we should really do that can we can we move to um as you, the biodiversity in a, in a greater sense not just the forest because we're seeing a, a lot of reduction in biodiversity through intensive agricultural practices uh, in the surrounding areas around the Carpathian Mountains as it's spreading. Um, foreign companies are coming in, buying land from local people and fencing off large tracts of land. And that somehow uh, sometimes prohibits access routes or traditional access routes or, or corrals animals to intensively graze in one area, um, which means they then need to use uh, fertilizers to, to, to uh, get the grass to regrow, which obviously is very bad for certain sensitive species. So um, this fencing issue must also have a huge effect on, on apex predators. And I'd like to, I'd like to ask uh, Gabriel whether he's noticed this uh, as an increasing problem and a threat to bear populations. Um, the, the, the proliferation of, of fences, which seems to be happening more and more in this country, and whether this will, this will have a profound change on the landscape. Uh, yes, well, of course, uh, one of the greatest risks is uh, habitat fragmentation due to roads, for example, or private properties that are fenced. And uh, the, we have mainly orphan bear cubs that come from forest exploitation disturbance, but there are also quite many cases of uh, car accidents, for example, or train accidents. And uh, in recent years, we've also had some cases of uh, bears being separated from their mother by dogs from the sheep folds, for example, yep. which I think these are increasing in number in the aspect of my knowledge. So yeah, this fencing is a problem. And for example, bears have been using for centuries the same spaces, habitats as humans did, but now everything is changing. Sheep folds that are constantly in one area 
when uh, in uh, in the past bears would use that during the night when the, the sheep would move out of there, but now they are in one area. I mean, I've seen, so, I've yes, seen, I, yeah, I've seen in Toplitsa, I've seen in, and uh, you know, heard descriptions of uh, in the Hotabachi Valley and various other parts of Romania where where there are actually fences going through forests, um, and and you know, actually cutting off uh, any any kind of um, roaming or migratory routes of, of these apex predators, not, not just bears, but wolves as well, for instance. Um, yes, should, this, well, should we do something? Is... Yeah, please, sorry, carry on. During the, during the communist times, for example, the, the whole forest was managed at a national level. And after that, uh, they were given back uh, in many places to local communities to, uh, to handle and exploit. So I think that's one of the reasons why you see forests which are cut off from, uh, from uh, hmm. the, the picture. How do you, how, how do you, I, I'd like to ask this um, um, to, uh, to Catalina. Um, is there a way to regulate this kind of spread of intensive agriculture and the threat that poses to the biodiversity? I think that the Ministry of Agriculture developed some projects in this regard and uh, they established a list of 20 uh, species uh, of birds that are endangered by, endangered by agriculture and they also established some measures to protect them. But there are, I mean, there are a lot, a lot of laws that apply to Natura 2000 sites, for example, which are just no, not for, being enforced. I'm sorry, can you... There are a lot of that? laws that, um, that apply to Natura 2000 sites, as I'm sure Christoph knows very well, that, that are blatantly not being enforced in many areas. Uh, yes, there are many laws, but this project of Ministry of Agriculture is applied everywhere in agriculture, not only in Natura 2000 sites. Okay, so they but I'm, I'm some measures, yeah. but I'm not aware of the implementation. How much these measures are respected? Absolutely, I think I think that's part of the problem, Christoph. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to I'd like to address that to you. Yeah, um, you know, when we um, we are not only active in the mountains. We also have this uh, big biodiversity farm in the Transylvanian hills. Uh, this is an area, and I think when we talk about agriculture in Romania, we have to distinguish quite well between different areas. Uh, so the Transylvanian Hills, this is this is where these problems occur right now that you're you're talking about. I mean, there is the big agricultural areas in the south of the country, you know, which is everything flat, which there's no trees, there's no nothing. I mean, they're having other problems. They're they're dealing mainly with problems of uh, of a lack of uh, precipitation. But in the Transylvanian Hills, it's a it's a different story because there we still have incredible biodiversity. Um, I mean, it's uh, it. Um, you know, it's well known that uh, Prince Charles is very much in love with that area. Uh, he visits it, I think, every year for a week uh, because it's so rich in flowers, in birds, uh, these oak pastures that are there are unique for Europe. Uh, so it's an it's an absolutely amazing place, and it's actually it's not very uh, productive in terms of agriculture. The soils are are a lot of clay. Um, you know, it's it's rather dry, arid uh, area. So it's it's you know it's not prime area for for um, agriculture, but it is definitely a prime area for uh, for biodiversity. So I think this would be a fantastic area to show how biodiversity farming could function. And you know, go over over big areas. You know, go over uh, go over hundreds of thousands of hectares there. And then, um, and this is again, you know, what the government, the uh, regional governments and the local governments should implement. There is already some really good examples how tourism has actually, and then, you know, a very, very low level tourism, but a very high quality tourism has saved some of these villages. And, and people nowadays, you know, live 70, 80% of their income actually comes from tourism. So. But this tourism again um, is there because of this uh, ancient traditional agriculture. So there should be uh, a focus in these areas, not to produce as much as possible, but to produce uh, products that can be uh, used also for tourism. And the product is not just 
beef or a tomato or an apple. Uh, this product is also flower meadows. This product is these ancient oak trees with uh, stack beetles and whatever it is. Uh, so I think here we we need again, you know, a change of paradigm so that the agriculture area uh, reconnects to its roots. There is still a lot happening. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. We just have to strengthen the uh, the current agriculture and avoid that this goes into uh, again, you know, mass production with uh, thousands of cattle on on the meadows, uh, or then you know, intensive uh, agriculture or whatever it is, just what you just mentioned. And uh, and I think it's again, you know, it's, it's from all sides. It's from the economy. It's from the uh, biodiversity. It's for rural life. It's just it has only advanced. But you know, we have to stop these few people that are heavily investing into that, and they that they have uh, other interests, and the big majority of the people there. Thank you. So um, I'd like to go back to uh, bears for a second. Um, are there more bears or less bears than there were ten years ago? I mean, how many bears do we have in Romania, Gabriel? And maybe uh, I'd like. I, I think you might have. All of you have a, a different answer to that because lots of people come up with different answers, including the hunting clubs, who I believe are or have been responsible for the census um, of, of a bear numbers. Uh, so um, are we facing a boom in bear populations now or, or do you think it's actually declining? We don't know. That right. is the real answer. We do not know. The last count that was done was done six years ago. And it was done using old methods, mostly the gathering the data was done by uh, counting the tracks. What we need right. to know is the, the bear is a very complex and smart animal. It goes through several stages of exploration, the winter sleep, and in spring it goes down, in autumn it goes at higher altitudes, and it can have up to 600,000 hectares of home range. So if you're counting the tracks, for example, then you might have one individual that walks through to maybe 20 people around. And if you count it like that, then you're not going to get the wrong number. So the only solution would be a proper genetical study, which takes a long time and a lot of money and with, person, with specialized personnel. Uh, this idea that there are too many bears, uh, it, it might be actually a concentration of bears because this is what they do, that there's an opportunist. So if you have an area with an abundance of food at one certain time of the year, then you will have a sleuth of bears there, maybe 20, 30 individuals, but the surrounding areas have no bears. So it, there's a dynamic going on and uh, we do not know how many bears Romania has. From what I've heard, the, the numbers go between 3,000 and 10,000 individuals, but there's no scientific data to prove So it's, fa it's fair to say that um, it would be a bit premature of the government to uh, put forward proposals for culling bear numbers until we accurately know how many bears there are in Romania. And there's also no direct link between the number of bears and the damages tax that they, uh, like in some countries, the bear population goes up, but the, um, the, the damages that they do go down. It all depends on how you manage the certain population that you have after you have the information of the dynamic of that population and the number and the state in which the habitat is because you also need healthy habitats which are undisturbed, for example, to have a healthy population of bears. And the disturbance keeps going up and up through tourism, which is uncontrolled, through uh, chaotic deforestation and uh, also agriculture. So is, 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 um, is illegal hunting or deforestation the, the, the biggest threat to bear numbers? Which, which is, which is would biggest... you say, more, more of a threat? The, the biggest threat is uh, the public's opinion of the species. There are right. countries which even one bear is too much. So if uh, people can understand that this animal, this emblematic species for Romania could actually provide for all their tourism, for example, to understand the value that it brings to their local, to their forests, then they might start protecting it. If you have a faulty compensation system uh, when you're receiving damages for your wild, of your livestock, uh, 
uh, of course, in accordance with the species that go down. And uh, also, the media has a big responsibility with this uh, to properly promote the message and situation in the country. So the biggest threat is how people perceive the species. Okay. Uh, Christoph, I know you've done a, a, a fair amount of uh, monitoring of apex predators, bears, wolves, lynx. Um, have you got anything to add to that? Uh, yes. Uh, I mean, we, uh, we are, as a conservation organization, we're the only organization outside the hunting clubs that has rented or leased hunting concessions. So we have four hunting concessions with a total of 65,000 hectares where we have stopped all trophy hunting and all sport hunting. And we focus only on, uh, on conflict management, but we have developed a, a monitoring program together with uh, three neighboring uh, hunting concessions with uh, regular hunters clubs. And what we do is we go basically for, you know, the, the, the most secure uh, way of monitoring, that is the DNA fingerprint. So we collect hairs, uh, feces, uh, urine in winter of the bears and the wolves as well. Uh, we monitor lynx with camera traps because every lynx has a very specific pattern on the fur. So you can identify every single individual lynx. And what we have found is we, we started to, uh, we had the first hunting concession in, uh, we took it in 2011 uh, and the last two in 2019. So we have now for quite a while, uh, all these hunting concessions. And this has been, especially during this time where, you know, the public outcry after they were uh, protected in 2016 uh, was that the bears are, are multiplying and there's so many now and they're coming all over us and uh, if the hunters don't save us from by shooting the bears you yeah. know we're gonna get eaten up all by the by the uh, by the bears uh, and we have actually found that if you take the reports of the hunters from the earlier years and then our monitoring with genetic information, you know, which is, which is, uh, I mean, there's nothing to discuss about them I and mean, genetics are genetics. Uh, we found that actually the bear numbers have not gone up at all. So that the, the number of bears are pretty much the same. Uh, they've even, they've, we've even found slightly less than the hunters claimed before that they were. Um, there's no, there's no um, development of a population since 2016 that would, you know, have any upward, um, upward direction but what we have seen is that the uh, behavior of the bears is changing dramatically and this is mainly due to climate change uh because uh you know still 10 they're, not years ago, they're not hibernating anymore so much are they exactly so still 10 years ago um uh, you know in sort of uh, late november early december you wouldn't see any more bear tracks in the forest if they got cold bears would, would disappear they would hibernate and then you know they would come out again sort of mid uh, mid march mid and end of march and now you know there's bear tracks all over the mountains throughout the whole winter so there's a big amount big number of bears that are not going hibernating anymore and then of course you know obviously in december in january in february in march they don't find food so there's no, no uh, there's you know unless there is a very big beech nut uh, crop from the autumn, uh, it's not that they find a lot of food. So they have to go and find that somewhere. And that gets them in contact or in conflict yeah. with the local communities. They get in conflicts with the farmers, and this is where the problems arise. So it was possibly a coincidence, uh, but it was also that. Um, until 2016, the hunters have been intensively feeding uh, wildlife and thus, you know, keep them away from the villages. Um, and then from 2016 onwards, once, once bears first were protected, um, they didn't feed them anymore. So the, the bears were suddenly, you know, where they had food, they didn't uh, find that anymore. So they were roaming around in other places. And this is now a situation that is very, very tricky. I mean, we have the same situation. What are we gonna do? Do we put food out somewhere in order to keep the bears away from the villages? But that means at the same time that those bears that would naturally starve over winter don't starve. So they reproduce. And so you exactly. So you're increasing the number by you, doing so. You, 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 you can't win. Or at least you're keeping the numbers high, not yeah. unnatural. And and if you don't feed them, you know the bears are coming into the villages. So it's a it's a very very tricky situation right now. And there is not just 
one thing that is the right thing, one thing that is the wrong thing. But I think, you know, what the government does at the moment, promoting uh, a sort of a quota for beers, that the, that the beers would be, um, you know, would be sort of shot just to keep numbers down. This is a totally wrong approach yeah. because it doesn't resolve the problems. So, so uh, let me. Uh, because, uh, we're, we need to uh, put some questions to uh, to our listeners. Uh, I'd just like to ask one final question. It, it's obvious from what you're all saying that um, you know, as we encroach on the habitat of of these apex predators, as we cut into national forests, and and uh, as as more forests are logged and more urban development sprawls, we're bringing these animals into closer and closer proximity to humans and we're reducing their habitat. So it's obvious that problems will happen. Um, but given that you had a situation in Borsha where nearly a billion euros of wood uh, was stolen over a 10 year period uh, and not one single person got prosecuted, went to jail or was fined. Uh, and everyone from the local magistrates to the police chiefs to all the local people knew exactly what was happening. Uh, and thousands of trucks rolled 24 hours a day through those roads. How how do we actually how do we actually protect Romania's forests? I mean, what can we do to stop this? And this is a question that obviously I, I would like to address first and foremost to Catalina. In terms of criminal um, investigations, I think that uh, the Romanian policemen and prosecutors are totally unprepared for any kind of environmental crimes. It's something that is highly unknown. So an education, not... to educate them, it, we, it's we a, need to educate education, them. Yes, education is very important. Environmental law is still not uh, an object of study at the university. It's only uh, half, uh, I think a semester class and it's optional and most of the students do not take it. Yeah, and eco studies is in fact, the prosecutors yeah. without any idea about any kind of environmental legislation, yeah. including environmental crimes. Okay, Christoph, same question to to you. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the problem is is quite obvious. I mean, we have a, a strong link between this timber mafia and uh, several of the political parties. Uh, this is all well known. Uh, so, I mean, there's a lot of um, protection there. Uh, from the political side uh, and you know at the same time there is then obviously not a lot of will to uh, to break this chain so I think uh, in respect to police and prosecutors uh, one of the problem is that you know they're they're sort of they're doing everything and they are being evaluated according to the percentage of uh, of cases that they that they resolve so if they have a murder and they resolve it and then they have a wood thief and they don't resolve it they still have 50 50. Um, wow. So if they have in total, you know, whatever, 60, 70 percent of the cases that they resolve, they're considered OK. Um, mm -hmm. And generally, you know, sort of these environmental crimes are not considered high enough importance to be um, to be treated in a way that there is enough interest here. So I think, you know, this idea that was discussed a year ago here with sort of an, an environmental um, anti-police and an environmental anti-corruption agency or even a forest uh anti forest police would be would be a great thing uh because yeah. simply because they still have to then you know prove that they resolve 60 or 70 percent of the cases so simply they have to go in this in this uh direction and in this field and resolve uh some of them they can't just say well this side you know we don't deal with that and we serve we, we do all the murder and the uh the the, the child uh, mistreatment yeah, whatever yeah. yeah yeah whatever it is you know so so i think that that could be something that would really uh solve a lot of uh, issues because they would be, be just there and would resolve 60 or 70 or 80 percent of the cases and they wouldn't be hopefully from the community that they're investigating and thus be a little bit more objective yeah um gabrielle i just like to ask that to you before we we turn to uh the audience uh have you got anything to add on that note no, I think that's clear. I think I think we have, yeah, exactly, uh, covered it. Well, look, um, thank you guys so much for participating, and um, thank you, David, for organising this. And uh, let me uh, hand it back to you, if I may, for questions from the audience.
Sure, thank you, Charlie. So I, I think just to, to, to pick up on that last point, uh, you, you've talked about some of the challenges of law enforcement within Romania, but of course, much of the logging is carried out by firms from other EU countries. So I'm wondering about the role of the EU as an organization or what efforts you're making to, to pressurize other member states to try to regulate or, or control some of the firms that are um, based in their own countries. What's, what's the role for the European Union in, in, in trying to get involved in protecting Romania's forests or, or the things that other member states might do? As I understand it, uh, the, they're not doing very much. Um, when I spoke to the president of biodiversity in Brussels, who came over, um, his, his response was that actually no one has submitted sufficient evidence uh, for them to be able to take direct steps to intervene. Um, and obviously I question this because as Christoph mentioned to me at the time, you only have to look at it from space to see, you know, quite how bad the damage is. But uh, I, I think a concerted effort needs to be made to engage, uh, you know, Brussels and uh, to, to try to have more international intervention in, in, in this because Romania is the custodian of the last great mixed forest in the whole of Europe. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, now, I think you all do great work, but I'm wondering about how you work together and with each other. Do you think, I mean, what kind of interfaces do you have individually as groups? I mean, clearly with, with um, Agent Green protecting the forests and, and the work that FCC is doing. And I know that, that Bear again recently has uh, been cooperating with FCC with one of its current orphans. So can you tell me a little bit about how you work together and, um, and how some of those collaborations came about? Yeah, if I may, uh, if I may start with that, I mean, of course, you know, the the amount of uh, organizations that work in that field in Romania is uh, not very big, so automatically we all know each other, um, and and the good thing is that we have very different roles. You know, we have sort of Agent Green as an organization that is very much in the advocacy uh, direction. Um, there is the uh, the bear um the bear or, or the, the guys that look after the bears and you know do that so for us this was fantastic because we had uh, it's now i think three weeks ago we had we found this uh this little baby bear that was uh at the edge of uh, a, an area where there had been major windfalls it's not it was not in our property but it was in generally in our hunting concession and uh and they started to clear all these timber so so the mother obviously ran away from the noise of the chainsaws and this little bear uh cup was here we wouldn't have known what to do with it honestly speaking because we don't have the capacity so we uh you know it was great that we had our friends over there and we could we could give him uh, this uh, this beer cup and you know we hope he's gonna grow and he's gonna be released at some point in time back into the wild so uh, so it's great you know we're having uh, we're having all very different roles so there is no competition at all and uh, and but it's also I mean it's not necessary that we do everything together because of these, these different roles but I think uh, overall you know we need actually uh, a lot more agent greens we need a lot more um, wildlife protection organizations, we need a lot more people that work directly on new protected areas. So Romania is, um, I should say, a developing country when it comes to organizations uh, that work in the field of environment, unfortunately. Another question then, I, mean, I, I see that a lot of, a, a lot of you are trying to encourage sustainable tourism, but I, I suppose one of the problems that comes with that, and you've seen it a little bit in the case of Biskri, um, the, the village that, that uh, Prince Charles is, is very much a fan of, that that has become such a tourist hotspot in its own right, that that is creating some negative consequences for that village. And I can sort of imagine a situation in which uh, you put together all these terrific projects to protect bears or to, uh, to protect the wild spaces, and yet that in turn attracts such a, a magnitude of tourists that, that perhaps you're going to create some, um, some downside from that. So I'm wondering about what, what sustainability and sustainable tourism looks like in that broader sense. Well, I'm, I'm happy to uh, chip in with an answer to that, um, if I may. Um, we've seen this a lot, and I think part of the problem is that only certain areas get promoted. So 
yes, if you funnel all the tourists and promote one area like Viscary, you're going to get a huge deluge of tourists. If you don't put bins up in national parks and provide for waste management, which is not really happening in Romania, then you get a huge litter problem, which is obviously very negative impact on the environment as well as on tourism. Uh, we need to uh, educate people here in Romania um, about uh, the uh, importance of sustainable tourism and how to contribute to that, not go, oh, there's lots of tourists coming. I'm going to start a quad bike rental business, uh, of which there have probably been about six um, cropping up around Bran in the last eight or nine months, uh, which do terrible, terrible damage to the forest. And uh, nobody respects the... Uh, the public rights away they go off road as much as possible uh, and this is a terrible problem i mean if it was me i'd have them all banned uh you need a license to use one and only for work but uh, you know there are issues and and i think we need to really brand romania in terms of green tourism and send tourists to different areas not just to the same places and and to regulate the numbers a little bit uh, and, and, and you can do that by uh, exacting a charge for parking at national parks, um, making sure that people know there are lots of different places they can go and see and promoting those internationally, which is what we've been trying to do. Excellent. Yes. And another point, we, we, there's, there was an election in Romania recently in the new government. And I, and I understand that the Agent Green's founder, Gabby Powell, is now an advisor to the government, Catalina. Do you think that's a, an indication that the the government is is, um, is ready to act. What, what what do you think the role of Agent Green can now be as it's interfacing with government? It's still not, not clear to me if the government is willing to do more for uh, environmental protection, but it's definitely a government that seems to be open to collaborate with civil society. And uh, unfortunately, uh, after, uh, in the last 30 years, I think that we had only one or two governments really willing to work on this on, on, with the civil society on various various issues. So this is very important, and I think it's a very good thing that uh, Gabriel Paun is a uh, honorific. It's, it's not an official advisor, uh, but it is uh, appointed as an advisor to the prime minister. And if the prime prime minister is, is willing to listen to what he has to say, has to say then I think it's a, it's a good thing. And uh, I really hope that uh, the, the government will uh, have uh, all, um, um, all his intentions to, uh, towards uh, proper collaboration with civil society. Unfortunately, I cannot say the same thing about the Minister of Environment that promised, uh, I think, two months ago that uh, uh, we will be included in some working groups on uh, passing new legislation and i still heard nothing from from them so sure but so uh, i suppose that leads to a natural closing question for me that maybe this is something we can go around and each of you can respond to you've got an audience some in romania some in the uk i'm sure people joining from elsewhere in the world so what would your one ask B for this audience, how would you like us to get involved? What is it that we can do to support your organizations or your, or your principles? What's, what's, what's your one wish for us tonight? Let's start perhaps with, with Gabrielle. Uh, my one wish would be to ask uh, all of the viewers to be respectful towards nature, never feed a bear. And if you have a little extra support causes, not just for bears, but environmental causes, social causes, just get involved. Mm -hmm. I think I think you know the uh, the most important thing is to encourage all the Romanian people, the, whether it's the prime minister or whether it's a peasant out there, to encourage them to understand that they have something which is very very unique for Europe, that they have sort of the, the crown jewels of Europe, and that they should use it in a proper way, not by destroying it, not by exploiting it, but by protecting it because that's by the end of the day the one that will get Romania the biggest advantages in all directions both economically socially and uh, and environmentally splendid Catalina any any thoughts I think uh, I still think that one of, of the main problems in Romania is education I think that the Romanians in generally need uh, lot raising awareness activities 
on the uh, importance of uh, environment and why what exactly needs to be protected, but also officials and uh, uh, people in the government, because sometimes they are annoyed by uh, evaluation procedures or by the need to um, to approve um, um, more uh, expensive projects just to avoid destroying some bugs. And this is exactly how they are talking. Some bugs, they are just some bugs, I don't care about them. Let's just not spend so much more money just to protect some sports, very small creature. So uh, I think that education and raising awareness are very important for, uh, for Romanians, are still very important because Actually, the government is not doing anything in this regard, and it's, I think it's up to us to promote such issues. And, and, and then, of course, raising awareness is very much what Charlie is doing through his films. So if you haven't seen the Wild Carpathia series, if you haven't seen Flavors of Romania, I do encourage you to watch those. And of course, look out for his Danube Delta documentary when it appears later this year. So on that note, let me thank all of our panelists, Christoph and the um, Foundation Conservation Carpatia, Gabrielle there again, Catalina and Agent Green, and of course to our moderator, Charlie Otley. Next week we have the third and final in our Romanian heritage season, and that is um, under the title of Erasure. It's going to look at Romania's vanishing Jewish heritage. So I hope to see many of you here again next week, uh, next Wednesday at 5 p.m. UK time, 7 p.m. Romanian time. Thank you again, and thank you, of course, to our co-hosts, the Romanian Cultural Institute in London. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much, guys.